legacy duplexes, triplexes, and, and quads, and de dadus and adus. Um, make our single family zones a more vibrant place than single family zone uh, necessarily demonstrates. And that's why a change to neighborhood residential is very appropriate. And that's Seattle City Council member Dan Strauss right there, chair of the Land Use Committee, talking about changing the name of single family zoning to neighborhood residential. What's in a name? If a neighborhood has a different name, does it smell as sweet? Well, we're going to talk about that and a whole lot more this week on Seattle News, Views and Brews, your Coffee Break political podcast. I'm Brian Callanan. I'm a host on Seattle Channel. The views expressed here are my own. And joining me in the Converge Media Studios this week, I'm with Kevin Schofield of Seattle City Council Insight. Kevin, this is an awesome studio here. Did you get your uh, all blue M&Ms in the green room over there? Did you get set up okay? Oh, I miss the M&Ms. Yeah, yeah. All right. but no, they look you right. up here at Converge. But but it's great. It is great to be here. Yeah. You, you get to see me live with my chicken scrawl notes here. <laughs> I but, tried with uh, the yeah, iPad here. We'll see how this goes. But yeah, uh, yeah super happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, and and big thanks to Converge for letting us shoot here. Absolutely, it, it's great to be with Converge once again. This is where our video podcast lives. So big thanks to them and a big thanks to the crew here. We'll talk about that in a minute. I wanted to thank especially our patrons, the patrons of the show, Seattle News Views and Brews. If you want to join in and become a patron, we would invite you to come in at the $10 level because then you can get one of these handy dandy mugs here. And I tell you what, we have our patrons send in their mug shot of the week this week. We have a very special one. We're looking at the crew of Converge. Check it out here. We've got Curtis. We've got Omari. We've got Ike. They're just mean mugging the camera here, but they're looking good with those mugs. You know what I'm saying? So we're glad to have their help. Very glad to have their help to make this show happen and very glad to have the support of all of our patrons out there. It's a big part of why this show runs. If you want to join them, please do Seattle News Views and Brews on Patreon. If you want to see the video version of the podcast, of course, it's on Converge Wednesday nights at 7. All right, we're going to get it rolling with right here, right now. So here we are in the last week of July. Where has the summer gone? Two things we want to focus on to start here on the Seattle City Council's agenda here this week. They're going to approve that parking rate increase around Climate Pledge Arena. When the big events happen, the prices are going to go up. We talked about that recently. But there's another issue, Kevin, I want to try to tackle here, and it has to do with the hazard pay increase that the council put in place a couple of months ago. Now, in doing this, they put something together and they said, well, when the uh, pandemic, the declared emergency, the pandemic ends, this will lift. But now Councilmember Mosqueda is saying, well, let's just kind of make this happen now. And I know there's been a little bit of questioning among the council members about this. Why is Councilmember Mosqueda pushing for this now? Well, she's pushing for it now because a, a lot of the reasons that she pushed for it in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, around measures and, and safety in grocery stores, yeah. uh, you know, in some ways she thinks are, are starting to pass, yeah. right? You know, we're seeing... Uh, you know, less restrictions in grocery stores. Mm -hmm. In fact, there, we see more and more people in grocery stores not wearing masks yeah, at yeah. this point. So a lot of the, the reasoning behind it is really passed. Okay. And she also believes that uh, the mayor may lift the, the emergency declaration yeah. as soon as, you know, around Labor Day. I, I wanted to ask about that because I know we've been talking a lot about ending this pandemic declared emergency. As we've seen the eviction moratorium is supposed to expire. I know they've said that before, but it's supposed to expire at the at the end of uh, September here. In looking at that, is that real? I just see the different Delta variants going around yeah, or whatever yeah. else. What, what do you think about that? Oh, well, you know, I've been talking to folks in City Hall, including yeah. some folks in the mayor's office, yeah. and I'm not at all convinced that, that the mayor is going to lift the emergency declaration uh, around the time the school starts. Because, in fact, you know, as, as, as much as we're hearing about the Delta variant right now, mm -hmm. and about 97% 90, of you know, hospitalization cases are people who are unvaccinated, you know, vaccinated, yeah. and the vast majority now of, of, of cases are, are Delta, Delta variant yeah. at this yeah. point. Um, we're still not vaccinating people who are under 12. Yeah, right? right. So that's going to be a lot of school kids going back to school. Yeah, unvaccinated. And, and even if there are better preca uh, precautions in schools, yeah, you know, those kids, a bunch of them, you know, we're, we're going to hear about Delta getting into these schools and yes. kids taking it home with them. Right, right. right. And we're going to see a few breakthrough cases here and there, although yeah. hopefully they won't be hospitalized. Yes, right. Mostly that's, that's, that's what most happens with, yeah. with the breakthrough cases. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, grocery stores could end up being vectors again this yeah. right and so there's some real concern in city hall that it may still be too early until we really get a handle on the delta variant yeah i know they've been talking about having those vaccinations ready to go for kids who are younger than 12 hopefully by this fall but i haven't heard that exact date that's going to be a 
a, a milestone moment, I think, in the in the pandemic. Yeah, well, and we'll see how low they go. With, yeah, with right, the right, 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 for that, right, 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 right. Okay, well, a lot still ahead with that one. We're going to keep uh, keep track of what's going on there. Next up, I want to break down a plan from the mayor to spend $10.4 million on BIPOC community groups specific to public safety here. So this plan submitted last week by Mayor Durkin. She's looking at the council to lift a proviso on this money to allow her to spend it. So, Kevin, your thoughts on this plan. 33 organizations I'm reading here getting this money over the next 18 months. That's the good news. but. It's one-time funding, maybe not as good news. What do you think about this money and the impact it might have? Well, you know, this is one piece of several True. different initiatives yeah. that are going on right now. They, yeah. And this one, they re the city hall said they got over 70 applications for, yeah. for those $10.4 million. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a good sign, a yeah. Total across of $40 million. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a lot more demand out there for programs, yeah. for funding for programs that could that do good in this community. Right. It was really focused on community-led solutions yeah. to end violence and increase safety, you know, within BIPOC communities yeah. you know it follows four million dollars that was allocated last year to mm -hmm. uh similar sorts of things yeah in a, in a grant that went to community passageways to do some work yeah um and you know even this week we've heard a couple of related efforts there was yeah. two million dollars that went out to the king county peacekeepers collective yep. mm -hmm. uh, dealing with gun violence dealing yeah. with gun violence yeah. and and we also heard at the end of the week about um a new initiative from uh, City Hall, from the, the announced by the mayor mm -hmm. and uh, the fire department, and the head of right, the new right, right, community right. Uh, safety and communications mm -hmm. um, organization, mm -hmm. to uh, create a new alternative 911 response yeah. unit called Triage One, mm -hmm. uh, because about 11 percent of the of the 911 right. phone calls right. they think could be responded to by somebody who wasn't a police officer with yeah. a gun. Right? Yeah, and, and I think that's a super important point because. We have seen shootings, unfortunately, on the rise in Seattle over this past year here. Uh, as I'm reading it here, as of June 30th of this year, Seattle had 232 shootings and shots fired, 15 fatal shootings as it's turned out. During the same time frame last year, the city saw 164 shootings and shots fired called. So the way I'm seeing the mayor present this is the city and county are going to work on the 911 alternatives, but the community groups getting the money are kind of working on prevention and, and restoration. Seems yeah, to be and, split. And, and in fact, what they said uh, when they announced this $10.4 million yeah. last week was that they got very few requests for funding for alternatives to 911 I response. See. Yeah. Right. That, and I've, I've heard this many times from organizations and from and from City Hall yeah. that uh, there just don't seem to be a lot of community-based organizations that are really willing to step up yeah. to the demands of lot, you know yeah. 24 by 7 by 365 911 response for this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that may be you know coming up with civilian-based alternatives. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to police responding to, to a large number of 911 calls right, may right. end up still being the responsibility of the government. Yeah. And then we leave the preventative and the restorative yeah. programs to community-based organizations. Well, you know, we'll have to see how this shakes out. Yep, yep. And a lot coming up in the next couple of days here. We're going to learn more on July 27th when the final appeals for these different RFPs, the request for proposals, uh, get settled up there on these, on these funding requests. Okay, so up next, can the city come through for a church in the Central District asking for reparations after church leaders say they were pressured into a land sale. That's coming up next on Now Hear This. Well, some big headlines last week from the Central District, from the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church, Reverend Robert Jeffrey Sr. spoke about a plot of land, now Spruce, Spree, uh, Spruce Street Mini Park, excuse me, next to his church there. So in 1969, the church was pressured to sell that land, the Reverend says, rather than face the city seizing it through eminent domain. So Reverend Jeffrey wants the city to return the property or pay its current value toward the church's housing projects here. Council member Shama Sawant is definitely on board with this one. She is asking the council to provide $10.7 million towards those projects, but she says passing a resolution on this is going to be difficult. I do not expect it will be easy to win. We will hear lofty words from the political establishment about equity and invest investment, but we'll also hear elaborate technocratic excuses about why this project cannot be funded right now or why there simply isn't enough money to fund all of the affordable housing that working people in our community need or why we shouldn't tax Amazon any more than we already have. So Kevin, Council Member Sawant, as she has done before, calling on her fellow council members for a, a lack of political will. We've certainly heard that before. Uh, there's a little more to this story, though, when it comes to parklands and the idea of 
giving the property back. Let's try to break this down. Yeah, so uh, we're going to dive into the details here dive of, away. The, of yep. the dreaded initiative 118-477. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which was, it actually, well, sorry, Ordinance 118-477, which was originally a voter initiative. Yeah. And it's one where... Kevin knows all these initiatives by heart. Just, all, just, all of them. All yeah, of them. I got, right I got off the top of the set. Yeah, yeah. Fired up. So um, this is one that originated as a voter initiative, and the way this process works is uh, it can get uh, petitioned to... Uh, to go on the ballot, mm -hmm. uh, and for the city, it then goes to the city council, right. and they have the choice, uh, three choices. They can just enact it into law. Mm -hmm. They can um, propose an alternative version, and both the original, the one that, that mm -hmm. you know, collected enough signatures, and the alternative go side by side in the ballot, the ballot right. or they can just send it right on through to the ballot. And right. in this case, they, sent, they uh, just enacted it. Yeah. They just enacted it straight. And so yes. what it says mm -hmm. is that the city can't just give away parkland. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They can only um, they can only get rid of parkland. Yes. When a there is no reasonable alternative. Yes. Mm -hmm. And b they acquire an equivalent mm -hmm. amount and type yeah. of new parkland yeah. in exchange for it. You got right? it. Yeah. So what this means is, can the city just give that land back? Well, it can't be that simple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If they, if someone comes up with an equivalent set of land, in in the area. Yeah. Right. That could be swapped. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And you know, the, and the city does do land swaps. Sometimes they do it internally. About a month ago, mm -hmm. they did a land swap between the Parks Department and SDOT. Right. You, in in a way that that fulfills sort of the requirements of of, of this ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, by they they needed what happened was nobody had noticed that Green Lake Park's actual boundaries extended mm -hmm. out into the street yeah. where they wanted to build a bike lane. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they gave that slice of property with the, where the bike lane was going to go to the yeah. city, mm -hmm. and then on the other side right. of Green Lake Park, SDOT gave a slice of a street yeah. and sidewalk to the park. Yeah. So it all worked out okay. Yeah. It yeah, was yeah. kind of even Stephen though. Yeah. I, it, I really wanted to get to this larger issue, what Reverend Jeffrey, what Reverend Jeffrey's talking about here, which is displacement. And it's a big issue, and I know the council talks about it a lot. I know in the central district, the displacement is severe. Some of the numbers I've seen, the neighborhood's only about 15% black now. It was 75% black in 1970, around the time when this property was given to the city, or sold to the city, I should say, for $34,000. Uh, but I'm looking at that, uh, Seattle as a whole, the number of black residents here, the lowest it's been in 50 years, some of the stats that I'm seeing there. So in thinking about that, that larger issue, I think this is something the city wants to respond to. How do they do it? What do you, is it a land swap or what do you think happens? I, I think it's going to be challenging. They, they, yeah. could, they could try to figure out a land swap. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they could, you know, one of the options that it sounds like Councilmember Swan is, and, and the Reverend are suggesting yeah. is making a payment instead. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. there are limits on their ability to give uh, out money. sort of yeah. yeah to give out money to specific organizations right, mm -hmm. right ab above a certain amount yeah. without the city getting something else in return for right that. so right. you know they they will give out grants but the grant agreement specify sure. what that organization is going to do with mm -hmm. that money mm -hmm. that is a benefit to the city yeah right yeah so their ability to just give money away Right. It, it is really limited. Now, you know, if it turns out, looking into this further, they find that um, that that the pressure that the city put on the church mm -hmm. sort of reaches a level of duress. Yes. Right. right. Then, it, then yeah. maybe it could raise legal issues. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. they could unwind it mm -hmm. through that. Yeah. But it, it, this is it's really going to get complicated. This is this is going to fixing this in practice is going to be messy. Yeah. And Despite everybody's best, you know, intentions of trying to find the right way to do right. Yeah. Well, I know Councilmember Sawant is going to keep uh, yelling and shouting about it, so the council is going to be responding to this in some way. Interesting to see what what happens next there. Thanks. Thanks for that breakdown. I wanted to move on, if I could, uh, almost a bit of a hidden story, if you will, emerging from the council in the weeks ahead. A new look at surveillance technology. I read about this in Publicola, Kevin. Councilmember Lisa Herbal wants to designate facial recognition as a form of surveillance technology, trying to close a loophole in city regulations after an officer used some unapproved facial recognition software. So the police department sees this kind of as a gray area. The council says this type of software is definitely prohibited. 
What's going on with this one, Kevin? That's an interesting back and forth, and we've had a few of these between the council and the police department. Well, in this particular incident, what happened was a, a police officer on their own volition, yes. not using technology supplied by SPD, right, right. took some photos and uploaded them to a system called Clearview AI yes. to see if if he could get some hits on yeah. on, on identifying, you know, some some suspects, mm -hmm. and uh, the the. Uh, Two things happened from that. The, the the department, all the way up to Chief Diaz, came back and said, you know, we don't do this. Yeah, this is right. this is this is out of policy for us. Yeah. But the OPA investigated this and they right. said it wasn't clear that what he did actually violated at the time mm. the the department's policies. Right. On right. This. So what Councilmember Herbal wants to do is make it clear that the city and SPD's policy is you do not use face recognition technology. Right, right. right. And banning face recognition technology is a trend right now. There are yeah. a lot of law enforcement yeah. departments doing it. There are a lot of cities and even Congress is looking at whether mm -hmm. whether yeah. there should be bans on face because recognition. Because basically technology. you're taking an image and using it against somebody's will. I mean that that's kind of the or using it against their permission, I suppose. Well well and and there's a lot of nuance here too, right? Because okay. there are questions about what expectations of privacy do you have if you're in public? Sure. If yeah. a public surveillance camera mm -hmm. catches you, yeah, right. And and the, the city's policy is they they have a um, they have an ordinance which That's says right. that that ordinance. all uses of technology potentially for surveillance purposes mm -hmm. have to go through the city council and be approved right. yep. by the city council. Yeah. Um, and, and that doesn't mean there will be none. Right. But but they want to make sure that that. You know, we're not creating a police state here yeah. with this, right? So, you know, SDOT has traffic cameras. Of course, right? yeah. That they use, and, and there's very, very tight rules that the city council, mm -hmm. you know, require to get this through. That's right. That limit um, the, the, the extent to which the recordings are, or the, the camera feeds are recorded. So they can okay. use them live. Yeah. They can capture small amounts in very limited ways with limited access by SDOT personnel right. to do traffic analysis yeah. and traffic studies. But, S uh, but yeah. SPD can't get at any of that. Yep. Now, there are interesting issues around that, too. In mm -hmm. fact, we just had uh, last week mm -hmm. uh, a report come out from the Office of Inspector General for Public Safety, what yeah. they call their, their Sentinel Event Review Report, okay. looking at event. Uh, one event in particular was uh, last summer when there was a group who went through the Chinatown International yeah, District okay. just doing a whole bunch of damage. Yes, yes, right. And and the, the knock on the police for that was they didn't respond quickly and they didn't really respond in yeah, force, right. right? As this group was just sort of doing going damage, yeah. going going through the CID doing a bunch of damage. Yeah. And the the Sentinel Event Review Panel came back and said, you know, it would have probably been helpful for SPD to be able to access SDOT's cameras yeah, yeah. to be able to, to see that. where yeah. they are mm -hmm. and send police officers to exactly the right spot right, to right, do that, right? right? right. And, but that's currently illegal yeah. under, under the city surveillance law policy. Yeah. So while it's, it's certainly trendy right now to yeah. be on face recognition, and there are good reasons for for doing that and for being really, really careful of it because mm -hmm. there are racial disparities. Of course, this, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's These systems, I can tell you, because I used to work in a research lab where there were a lot of people working on face recognition technology. Yeah. The, the, the data sets that they use to train these over-index on white people, yeah. right? And they over-index on men. Yeah. So the systems have lower accuracy for women. Interesting. And a okay. lot lower accuracy for people of color. That's not cool. Right? Okay. And um, and it's it's totally not cool, right? Yeah. These are the systems, right? So to the extent these systems are used to sort of flag suspects yeah. and might end up harassing people or yeah. become probable cause yeah. in lawsuits, you know, uh, or or arrests for people mm -hmm. of yeah. color. Yeah. Um, that could be really, really problematic. So yeah. you have to be super, super careful. But you also don't want to go as far as to say there are absolutely no, no uses yeah. and opportunities that would be beneficial. Interesting. This. this is going to be a great policy discussion. Thank you it for is. that piece here. All right, we're going to wrap up with a look at an upcoming public hearing on a potential name change that could affect the zoning in your neighborhood. Or will it have any effect at all? That's in our final segment here. What's next? <laughs> have a public hearing on the idea of changing the name of single family zoning to neighborhood residential. Now on the surface, I don't think this seems like too much of a difference. Like if you change your name to Kev Sco Money, like we could still hang out, right? 
I, I'm doing that next week. Okay. It's, I can't I, wait. How'd you hear about that? <laughs> make it legal. Make it legal. I'm just trying to figure out what it means to make that name change here. It doesn't seem like too much on the surface to me, but what are your thoughts there? Well, yeah, you can certainly look at this one level and say, hey, one more example of the city council, the Seattle city council being performative, right? Mm, yeah, Making, right. you know, meaningless changes to yes, that names yes, yes. and things mm -hmm. like this. The single family zoning has an enormous amount of baggage. Mm -hmm historical Agreed. emotional baggage mm -hmm. for, for folks because it's exclusionary. It, 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 it comes out of um, a long and well-documented history of exclusionary mm -hmm. racist yep. zoning yep. and other practices that have kept a number of you know a large number of neighborhoods in the city unaffordable to people of color yeah. and to mm -hmm. low-income people yeah, yeah, right? yeah and so you know but but let's let's be clear about what this is this is the warm-up act yeah. to a major effort in 2024 yeah. mm -hmm. to remove single-family zoning from the city's comprehensive plan. Yeah. Once yeah. every eight years ago, uh, eight years, we do a major update to it. It's coming yeah. in 2024. Right. This is. And in fact, just last week, council members Mosqueda and Morales held a sort of online town hall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a panel talking about all the reasons why we should do exactly this. Yeah. Right. And, and it is going to be a heated battle. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we have the urban village pol you yes, know, yes, growth yes. policy that mm -hmm. we have right now is yeah. because back in the 90s, mm -hmm. when they were doing a comprehensive plan update, they, uh, there, was, there was a big push. Mm -hmm. and, there, you know, and that's not the only time yeah. to, to get rid of single family zoning. Yep. And uh, there was an enormous pushback mm -hmm. on that, yeah. right? And the compromise, the grand compromise it came to was focus all the growth in urban villages. Yes, right. right. And I know and the council's been kind of pushing towards that now with, when you look at mandatory housing affordability. And when that happened with the last round of up zones, what, a couple years ago, we saw something like 6% of the single family zoning area kind of get shifted in there? Are we gonna see more of that? I, I imagine that's the concern of some neighborhoods or what? what is next here? Well, I, I think, uh, well, actually what's next yeah. is we have another round of city council elections yeah. in 2023, right? right. Yeah, right? Good point. You know, good the point. big vote in the city council on this is gonna be in 2024, yeah. right? Yeah. So not only do we have this year's council elections yeah. for two positions, we have seven more in 2023 yep. after redistricting. Mm. We get the right. census That's results. Right. Those lines we get, get redrawn. We yeah. get the census results later this year, yeah. and then within you know six to nine months after that, wow. we're going to have you know new boundaries for the districts. They're probably not going to change very much, but there yeah. may be a little bit. It'll be something. And then in 2023, we're going to have seven city council members elected, and they're the ones who are going to be voting on whether to make this kind of big change in the comprehensive plan in wow. 2024. That's that's a huge deal, and thank you for looking ahead on that. We do have a lot of elections to think about, not just this year, <laughs> but well into the future. So uh, I guess it'll keep us busy. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? Yeah, it'll definitely keep us busy. Well, I wanted to make sure we wrap up as we usually do with uh, talking about some of the sweet things that you can have on your coffee break. And we haven't been able to do this live in, what, a year and a half, Kevin? Yeah. That ain't right. Time. All right. All right. I'm going to pass you a little napkin here so you're all set. Um, this is what makes the coffee breaks gr great, I'll tell you. So this is a raspberry brownie with a blackberry ganache on top that my oh. uh, daughter made. Grab that one with the, with the blackberry on it. They're fresh. Two of them. Yeah, and they're fresh out of the yard. Oh, oh they're totally, gooey. Oh, they're you're, totally gonna have you're gonna have stuff oh, all over yeah. your hands. Oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're fudgy. I'm just gonna warn you. Now, take a little rip. What do you think? Give me, give me, the, give me the stats here. Mm. Yeah? Super moist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh, man. That is very fudgy. Yeah, it, what she, so. It's, any it's any really thoughts? It, it's good. The blackberry goes super well with it, though. Mm -hmm. Right, it's good. Good balance of taste. The raspberry needs to come through a little more or something. What's going on there? A little yeah. more on that. I mean, it's sweet. I mean, don't it's get sweet. me wrong. The, I don't. I don't. The frosting on top super sweet. Um, the nice part is the chocolate part is really not super sweet. Yes, right. right. So, so again, that's a good kind of balance there. Okay. I'm gonna get, have more. I'm going back for more. Do it. Do it. Kevin's all about getting the balance, not only in journalism when it comes to eating some quality baked goods too. So this is what we always talk about at the end of the show. And Kevin, as always, I appreciate your insights, my man. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank all you right. for walking us through it all. Cool, cool. All right, good to be back here at Converge again too. So thank you very much, Kevin, for your insights as well. Thank you to our patrons. Please do support us on Patreon. Again, we're hoping to get your support at the $10 level so you can get one of our awesome Seattle News Views and Brews mugs. Make sure you do it. The crew here at Converge Media has it going on, and you can too. So thank you for keeping our show going. And a big thank you to everybody out there listening. 
It's Seattle News, Views, and Brews, where you can always find out what's brewing in local politics. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you might listen. Again, please do become a patron on Patreon if you like what you're hearing. It has been awesome to be here live at Converge Media. We really appreciate their help. Again, watch us on Converge Wednesday nights at 7. We'll see you next time. Seattle News, Views, and Brews is an independent production of Callanan Media Services. Copyright 2021.